new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible study we have today. We thank you for all the fellowships we've been having. We thank you, Lord, because of your truth that you have been imparting unto us through our leaders. We do praise your name because of what we do see, what we do hear, and what we experience of the impact of your word. Father, we pray that all that you have been doing in our hearts will remain permanent in Jesus' name. We pray, o Lord, the compassion you've given us for the souls so we can reach out to them and bring them to you. We're asking, O Lord, this compassion or passion for souls will remain within us in Jesus' name. Here we are today, wanting to study your word in depth. We're praying, O Lord, that your spirit will assist us to see the things you have reserved and prepared for us in your own word, that we will be better people, better Christians, better disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that your grace will be more abundant in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Lead us on, O Lord, and lead us through, that we may live lives that are glorifying to you, edifying to members of the body of Christ, and challenging to people in the world. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, we continue with our study of the Colossians, and we're looking at four important verses today. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. Colossians chapter 3, from verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. These verses of scripture 
reveal more of the Christian life. The Christian life is characterized by a coming out of and a getting into. Or we can say the Christian life is characterized by a putting off of something and a putting on of another thing. The old life is mortified and the new life is manifested. In these verses that we're looking into in depth today, the apostle turns from the negative deed that we're to put off, and then he comes on to positive, practical Christian living. The old life has been mortified, put to death, taken away, and that gives place to a new life, a new life of love, a new life of righteousness, a new life of new relationship with God, with Christ, with one another. We are brought into new relations with others. Our relationship with others must then of necessity reflect a practical working out to see how a new man is to show himself in a new habit, in a new style of living. The present study then highlights the new lifestyle the most essential and all-encompassing Christian virtue, that is, true Christian charity. And that is what we're talking about today, true Christian charity. There are three things that stand out very clearly, which brings us to the fact that there are three sections we want to divide the study into. Look at verses 12 and 13. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. And if any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. In those two verses, we hear the apostle addressing the Christians, and he brings out some things that should be characteristic of Christian holiness, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, or endurance, forbearing or forbearance, then forgiveness. All these things we sum up together in one word, character. So, the first point we'll be looking at will be Christian character. Look at verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. It's talked about character. Then it says there is a bond of perfectness. There is a kind of belt that makes everything to be firm together on your spiritual life that doesn't make all these other graces and virtues we have read about in verses 12 and 13 to be scattered all about. It gets them together, collects them together, makes them function in harmony, and it mentions what it is right there. It talks about charity. So that is the second point, Christian charity. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, so that which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Here he talks about peace. Then he talks about thankfulness. But then there is something in the middle of that peace and a thankfulness that is on the one hand of the liver. We have the peace of God. On the other side of the liver, we have thankfulness. And in the middle, the pivotal point is our calling. It says, to the which also ye are called in one body, which means our calling in the Lord makes us to live at peace. Peace with God, peace with one another, and peace within ourselves. And it is this calling also that makes us to be thankful in everything. And so point three will be our calling. 
three points we're looking at today in this study. Number one, Christian character. Number two, Christian charity. Number three, Christian calling. As we look at Christian character, we see what Paul the Apostle had been saying. If you look at it from the beginning of this chapter, it's talking about the fact that we're reasoning with Christ. We're identified with Christ. Because of this, we see those things which are above. He talks in verse 2 about our affection, that our affections are now on things above. That is everything we do now because of our new state of life, because our new status in life, because of our spiritual posture, that we should think of the glory of God. We should think of the desires of the Lord. We should think of the delight of the Lord and the calling of the Lord. We set affections on things above. He talks about the fact that we are dead. We are dead to the things of the world. Our life is filled with Christ in God. That is, our life should be lived to the glory of God above. Then he tells us we're even expecting the coming of the Lord. After he has said all these things, he said, we shouldn't be what we used to be. We shouldn't be living a low life, earthly life that has no supernatural element in it, then he tells us if we are going to live such a kind of life that we have to put some things up and bring some things in. We have to get out of what we have been in the past and get into what Christ has now provided in the kingdom. Then Paul the Apostle uses uh, the language of dressing, putting off a kind of garment and putting on another kind of garment in verse 8. But now, he also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, fill the communication out of your mouth. And then in verse 10, and I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, he's telling us that we should look into the spiritual wardrobe. That when we serve the devil, when we serve the flesh, when we serve the world, there was a kind of spiritual garment we put on, a kind of robe, a kind of covering that we put on. It says now, we want to serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We want to follow after the Prince of Peace. Because of that, our status has changed. Our position has changed. Our lifestyle must also change. And the garb or the garment we put on must change. Let me illustrate it to you this way. A lady has been serving a coal miner and she served in this coal pitch and the coal is black and with all the uh, things that were all the dust coming out of that uh, coal she's black all over and she didn't worry to change because she knew that the work was not finished yet and she was going into that place and getting out the coal hands are dirty feet are dirty clothes are dirty the air or the scalp is dirty. Everything is dirty. And uh, she's been serving like that in a coal mine. But now, all of a sudden, things change. And uh, she's told, you're not going to be serving here anymore. And you're going to get married uh, to somebody who is settled in a home, in a very peaceful home, in a very neat environment. And now, that person, your husband, is calling you that you will come into the home and leave that coal kind of business alone. What's the first thing she's going to do? She's going to change. She's going to put off the clothes she's been wearing. She's going to be washed very clean. And she's going to put on a new kind of garment. That's exactly what the apostle is saying. It says, you've been serving the devil. And the devil is black inside and outside. Everything he does 
everything he says is black. He does everything he does in the night, in darkness, undercover. And we have been serving the devil, serving the flesh, serving the world. And we've been dressed black. Our character, our behavior has been completely evil. But then we learn about the Lord, the lover of our soul. He wants to get married to us. And he wants us to be the bride. And therefore, the first thing we do, we say, I cannot be with Christ like this. I have to change my spiritual garment. I have to put off all this and put on new things. And as Paul the Apostle has already spoken about, what we put off. Now he comes on to what we put on. The Apostle having taught the converts to strip the filthy rags of their old life now takes us into the Christian spiritual wardrobe. And it shows us the robes of righteousness and the beauty of holiness, which we must adorn ourselves in. It's talking about the character of the new life, which the new man in Christ, Jesus, should have. And they are listed here. I've read them to you already in verses 12 and 13. It talks about holiness talks about compassion, that is, powers of mercy, about kindness, about humility, that is, humbleness of mind, about meekness, long-suffering, that is, endurance, about forbearance, forbearing one another, and he talks about forgiveness. This new life is mandatory for everyone who testifies to a union with Christ, that is, it's compulsory. And there are not, in the New Testament, two groups of virtues. One set of virtues for leaders, and then another set of virtues for members. No, not at all. All Christian disciples are to live the new life of righteousness and holiness. Let's try to pick these things one by one. And remember, you heard about the grace of God yesterday. Evidence of the grace of God in our lives. And when we know the Lord, when we have been saved, when we have come before the Lord, and we now belong unto the Lord, this will be the evidence of the grace of God in our lives. Thank God for the message, effective, powerful message yesterday. And thank God that we have prayed and that we have asked God to give us even grace upon grace, more grace, Abundant grace, grace for every situation in our lives, and grace for a new relationship with the Lord and with one another. Now, these are the things that will come out as our conduct, as our character, as the interpersonal relationship that will be coming out of our lives because we have received of the grace of God. Let's look at them one by one. Put on, therefore. As the elect of God, holy and beloved. It says, This is our responsibility. It says, Put on, therefore. It says, We have the word of God. It says, We have the grace of God. It says, We have the mind of Christ. It says, We have some level of maturity already. It said, Go ahead and put on this thing. That it is not God that will force them on you or force them on me. That it is not even Christ that will force these things on you or force them on me. That because we are Christian and we have intelligently repented, intelligently given ourselves unto the Lord that we can put on all these things. It is not the pastor or the leader in the church that will force them on you. No. We came to the kingdom of God voluntarily. My brother, my sister, didn't you come voluntarily saying, I surrender all. I give myself to Jesus. When you look at Calvary, when you saw everything that Christ had done, and your heart was moved to come unto the Lord, you said, I will repent, and so you did repent. And you said, I will come to the Lord, and so you did come. And you said, I will be a child of God, and by faith you believe. And now your sins are forgiven. 
Now you are a child of God. You are beloved in the sight of the Lord. Holy. Because he has called you with a holy calling. He said now, voluntarily, put on all these things. Put on all these things. Powers of mercies. That's the first thing. It says the very first thing is that we should have compassion. Bowels of mercies. This is illustrated to us in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. We'll not read the, all the verses we could have read from verse 23 to verse 35. There's no time to read everything. But the point is this, that this servant we're reading about here was forgiven. The master had compassion on him. Look at it from verse 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Well, you know that story already. That's your own story. How God forgave you of everything that you ever did. And there was no sin to your account anymore. And he counts you no more an enemy. No more a sinner. No more a rebel. No more a person fighting against his maker. But he counts you his child, beloved and holy. He counts you his child, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He delights in you. He rejoices in you. His banner over you is love. And you say, the Lord is mine. I am paid. But this servant, out of that compassion and forgiveness, he went out. He saw another individual that owed him something, something very small, something very little. And eventually, what happened is that he couldn't have pity on this other person. No compassion. And he said, no, you must pay me all. And eventually, the master, the Lord, heard about it. And he was not happy. And he said in verse 33, Shouldest not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? That's the question the Lord is asking you, my brother, my sister. Shouldn't you have had compassion on thy fellow servant, who also have offended you, put on therefore bowels of mercies, put on compassion. You know, the Lord gives us opportunity every time to show if we're grateful for our own salvation. You know, uh, last Saturday, I was talking to the workers, and I was talking about spreading the word of the law. The reason I'm repeating a part of that message now is that uh, some of our members are not there because we are not all workers. And I said, we're to spread the word of the Lord. We do not spread the mistakes of other people. We do not spread the family problems of other people. We do not spread the shortcomings of other people. And, you know, this is a mistake that some people have made. They see the coordinator standing there, and then some things begin to run in their mind. I know this, I know this. It says, cover it up. It says, don't even talk about it. It says, have compassion. Because the Lord has had compassion on you, shouldn't you also have had compassion on your brother? You know, sometimes it surprises me in a church where we preach holiness, where we preach sanctification. It may be that, you know, the coordinator might have, you know, done something that, you know, we're family, and we rebuked him for it. And that coordinator now is standing in front of you. And then in your mind you begin to say, we don't want this coordinator. We want another coordinator. How could you say that? What if the angels will say, we don't want this man to be in the kingdom of God because we know his past. As the Lord has had compassion on you, look at all the angels. They rejoice because of you. Don't they know you are a sinner? Doesn't God know you are a sinner? Doesn't Jesus know you are a sinner? But they cover it up. They just rejoice because of you. And think how bad you were. Don't reject anybody. Don't be negative on anyone. And just spread the word of law, the word of compassion. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, bowels of mercies. 
Forgive our brethren. Forgive those who have offended you. Have pity on them. Overlook everything that has been said, everything that has been done, whatever you have heard of negative things before, of your fellow brother, of your fellow sister. Let's treat one another as members of the same family. And let everyone be happy. I am accepted in the fold of the children of God. The same thing, husband, accept your wife. Forgive your wife. Have compassion and pity on your wife. The same thing, my dear sister, forgive your husband. Which husband have you read about in this world that never offended a woman? That is never offended the wife. Maybe since the world began, maybe we can count a few. I have not known them, but maybe we can count a few. If uh, your husband has offended you once in a while, that's not a peculiar thing. Forgive and overlook and have pity. Have compassion. And you know, Jesus said something witty. When he was uh, teaching the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he said, if you don't forgive your brother or your sister, your neighbor, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you. If you want to get to heaven, this is the number one prerequisite. You must forgive. You must have compassion. If you judge other people without mercy, God will be judging you without mercy on the last day. I don't want that to happen to you. Have compassion on other people. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? That's talking about bowels of mercy. That is, we see poor people, we see naked people, we see underprivileged people, we see the people that have no job, we see needy people in our midst. What are we to do? We're to deal out our bread to them. We're to act like the good Samaritan acted. We're to show mercy. We're to have compassion. Have bowels of mercies every time. Don't do like those brethren of Joseph. When they were selling him into slavery, he cried, he wept, as their own junior brother. And do you know they looked away from it? Do you know they didn't care for the agony, for the suffering? No, that will not be right. We in the New Testament, we should put on bowels of mercy. Is it on your child? Put on bowels of mercy. Is it on your fellow brother, fellow sister in the church? He has offended and Maybe you said, I don't like that, I don't like that. Well, let all that stop. He has seen the point and he has corrected the point. Let there be powers of mercy. Or there has been a disagreement between one brother and another sister. Uh, it may be on marriage. Well, very touchy area, very sensitive area. And maybe, sister, you have been disappointed. What are we going to do? Are you going to kill that brother because he disappointed you? Are you going to crucify him because he disappointed you? Are you going to say, if they allow him to teach the scripture in this district church, I cannot stand it. Why? Why? Why can't you just forgive and forget and just have compassion? That's the evidence of the grace of God in our lives. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Here is Christian character. You know, let's say, okay, for example, somebody loses a job. That's a big blow on his life already. But then the blow is made more terrible. If you talk about it, if you blow it up, if you spread it all about, if you talk about it as, oh, so it's a useless fellow. Do you know now, he has no job. I, in fact, helped him with five naira, ten naira yesterday. That's going to be a greater blow. Don't, don't talk like that. Against somebody that is going through a problem. Or somebody has shared with you, he has a very deep hurt inside. And he says, my brother, pray for me. I'm going through deep waters. And you appear to be a friend. You pray with him. And then you go back to other places to begin to say, so-and-so, 
Well, I'm praying for him, but you know he's in trouble. If he hears that you are blowing all that about, it's going to knock him like a, like a real hammer. And it's going to even be more serious than the problem he shared with you. But remember them that are in bonds. Asleep, you are bound with them. If you have that kind of problem, asleep, you are bound with them. If you have that kind of problem, would you want people to talk about it? Would you want people to publicize it? Will you want people to be like a loudspeaker, beaming it all to the world? No. Then don't proclaim. Don't uh, blow it up. All the things that they are saying, that they have confided in you, this is my problem, that's my problem. And of course, uh, my uh, fellow preachers, uh, zonal leaders and coordinators and women representatives, Whenever you teach that the scripture, or you are teaching on Sunday, on Monday, or on Thursday. You know, the greatest temptation for a preacher, the greatest temptation for a preacher is to use illustration that will be what some people have told you privately of their personal touchy or touching problems. When you preach and you use those illustrations, you blow people's minds. You damage people's confidence that they put in you. And when you mention that thing and you describe it, you think you are preaching. You think you are making an illustration. And you know, it is not good. It makes people to feel that they made fools of themselves by confiding in us as preachers. Let us respect people, love people, have compassion on people. So then, Christian character, the first thing is that we put on barrels of mercies. Barrels of mercies. Then it talks about kindness. Talks about kindness. And uh, there are always opportunities to be kind. And I want you to just put this on. Put it on. Every time. You see, for a child of God, the kindness is there. I'm sure you know that when we are born again, God puts the Lord within us. Oh, you see, I don't have kindness. I don't think so. Now, let's go back to our illustration. Look at the wardrobe. And uh, maybe you don't look at that tie. You don't put on that tie, but you have it. And every time you say, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I don't have time to put on that tie now. And people will look at you, and they've not seen you putting on a tie for one month. Or even for six months. What's their conclusion? Well, they may conclude it doesn't have any tie. But that's not the truth. You have it, but you do not have the patience to wear it. Or let's take some of us who dress the way we dress now, shirt and a pair of trousers. And uh, somebody looks at you and he says, oh, brother, so-and-so, he doesn't have any national dress, any native dress. I've never seen him wear national dress. And uh, two brothers begin to argue with one another. Oh, brother so-and-so, <laughs> I don't think he even has a single piece of national dress. And then you are passing by, and you heard, and they said, bro, come. We're just talking about you. You say, what have I done? Well, you have not done anything bad. We're just saying that you don't have any national dress. Oh, he says, I have. And they open their mouth, they say, what? We've never seen it on you. Then you say, well, you know, I ride motorcycle a lot, and I just don't feel like, you know, putting on this flowing thing. You have it, but you never use it. The same thing with kindness. It's available to you. You already have it. Jesus Christ has made it available to you. So, if you don't put it on, it is not that you don't have it. It is because you are not taking time. You are not taking time to put it on in the presence of a wife. Kindness. Put it on with your husband. Kindness. You have it. When you talk about your brother, when you talk about your sister, or when there is something wrong, you know, in the family, in the large family of the body of Christ, put on kindness. You have it. You have it. Don't say, I don't have kindness. Every child of God has kindness. Look into that wardrobe and put it on. But let me tell you something. When you have not worn a kind of cloth for about maybe one year, Although it's there in your wardrobe every time, and it is clean, and it fits into your size, and it belongs to you. When you put it on for the first time, and you come out, you are going to be looking as if 
uh, people will think I am strange. You are not strange. It's your clothes. Go ahead. The same thing with kindness. If you stop, let's say you are a sister, and you see a little boy, a little girl, while you are coming to the fellowship, and the boy maybe hurt himself, or the girl hurt herself. Now you have the kindness to just branch there, take care of the child, and uh, make the child not to cry anymore. You've not done that for a year. The moment you begin doing, doing that, something will tell you within you that that looks awkward. That looks like you are not yourself. Now, uh, but do it. Do it. It fits you because it is the grace that Christ has made available to you. It may be that, you know, in the past, uh, because your husband is out of job, and uh, it's not been very easy at home. You are the breadwinner. You are the one that is going out here and there and preparing the food and bringing all the money in. And maybe in the past, whenever you bring the food on the table, what you'll be thinking of is the man has no job. He's just there or he's getting a job. But, you know, my, the money he brings in is not as much as the money I bring in. That's the attitude before. But now, kindness is there. You didn't put it on. You now want to put it on. And uh, you bring, you set the table, you make it very neat, and then you put the food there, you put the cutlery there, and you act, even in the physical, as if you honor, you are serving the president of the country. And your husband can see that. And your husband is going to feel, what? Is this my wife? What kindness is this? I'm telling you, my sister, that food is going to be sweeter, more palatable than what he ate in the past. The same food, Kindness will make it sweeter. The same water, the same cup, and the same cutlery, kindness is going to make that thing better than it was before. Put it on. Humbleness of mind. Be humble. Let's be humble to one another. The younger to the older. And even, you know, sometimes the older to the younger. You know, it will be unfortunate if I, for example, as a pastor, if I cannot sometimes be humble before the coordinators and respect the great, great work they're doing, and before the members of the choir, before the workers who are working along with us. In fact, that's what the Bible says. Look at this. In First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. From verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. But that's not the end. It says ye, all of you, that includes me, that includes you, that includes husband and wife. It is not just the wife that is to be submissive or humble before the husband. Look at this. All of you, all of you, all of us, the, old, the older to the younger, the younger to the older, yea, all of you, it says, be all of you, be subject one to another, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the, to the humble. Therefore, let us submit one to another. How about in our family setting? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. But let it be the healing man of the heart, in that, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet Spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. My sister, if you are married, argument with your husband is not a great virtue. It's not a virtue at all. My sister, if you are married, being buoyant and outspoken and aggressive and argumentative and proving your point and being very logical and being bossy, no, that's not the right in the sight of God. It's meekness. Don't you see the Lord Jesus Christ who was led a sheep to the slaughter and yet he opened not his mouth. You know the ornament, the greatest ornament you can have is not this, uh, you know, physical beauty. Thank God you are beautiful physically but it's not the natural beauty. It's talking of the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which in the sight of God is of great price. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, 
with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Forbearing one another in love. Let all our actions be actions of love. Chapter 5, verse 2. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Chapter 4, verse 32. Be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That is it. That is the Christian character. And brothers and sisters, let's put it on. And however good your dressing is, however good your outlook is, if you don't have all these things, you are not well dressed yet. You know, some ladies, before they go out, if uh, you know, they have worn a good a pair of shoes. They've had a good dress on. They look very smart and very neat, very charming, very beautiful. But they have not put on some jewelry, some earrings. Oh, they say, this is not complete. I'm sure you don't think like that, but I want you to think like this. That whatever dress you put on, whatever good looking you put on, if you don't put on compassion, you are not well dressed enough yet. If you don't put on kind words, if you don't put on humility, if you don't put on meekness and long-suffering and endurance, and if you don't put on uh, forbearance and forgiveness, you are not fully dressed yet. If you get dressed in the physical and then you manifest anger, you spoil everything. You are not well-dressed. Whatever good-looking you may be, you, you man, you, you have that smart suit and it's just, it's just your cord. They just put it on you and they say, this is just marvelous. It's the, it's the masterpiece of, of, the, of the decade. And this is just great. But if you don't have kindness towards your wife, compassion towards your neighbors, humility between you and your wife and between you and your neighbors, and meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, and forgiveness, you are not well-dressed yet. However good-looking we may be, let's put on as part of a spiritual garment, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, endurance, forbearance, forgiveness. Let's forgive one another. Whatever we have done, whatever has happened, let's forgive one another. Now, the next point is what we're told in verse 14. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Put on charity. Before I explain that verse, I want to tell you that the New Testament especially has a lot to say about charity. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 1, but as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge perfect up, but charity edifies. Notice that point, charity edifies. Charity builds up. You want to edify your neighbor, edify or build up another fellow believer, edify the church, build up the church, this is one thing that builds up the church. Charity. Charity edifies. In chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that he may prophesy. Follow after charity. That is, don't let it leave you. And don't allow charity to be separated from you. Let it be part of your life. Follow after charity. Others may follow after wanting to revenge, wanting to fight back, wanting to have their way, wanting to strike that fellow because that fellow hurt me and I'm going to show him that I know how to revenge you. They may follow different directions. You have just one direction to follow. Follow after charity. Towards your wife, follow charity. 
towards your husband, follow after charity. Towards fellow workers in the office, follow after charity. In your conversation, follow after charity. Everything and anything you do, follow after charity. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, let all your things be done with charity. You see that? All things. Not only some things. Let all your things be done with charity. Now, this is the way you should look at this. You want to take a step. Ask yourself, can I do this thing in charity? Can I do it in love? Am I doing it with consideration for other people? The, or this thing, can, will it be done with um, a kind of hatred, bitterness, a kind of impatience in my heart? And I'm just after that fellow. This word I want to speak. Am I speaking it in charity? Any word I cannot speak in charity must never be spoken. Any step I cannot take in charity must never be taken. Any action that I cannot uh, bring out in charity must never be brought out. And anything, any look, any attitude, you know, sometimes it's not even what we say. It's the look on my face. Sometimes it's the way I, I look at a fellow that may make the fellow feel that I've committed the unpardonable sin. I've committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. You know, sometimes the look on our face can even be weighty, weightier than the words of our mouth. That means, is my look a look of charity? Is my attitude an attitude of charity? Is my word a word of charity? Is my action an action of charity towards my fellow brother, towards my fellow sister? Let all your things be done with charity. Let's look at Second Thessalonians chapter, Second Thessalonians chapter one. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounded. That is, you know, it is possible for you to show charity to a few brethren, a few brothers who understand you, a few sisters who love and respect you, but it says our charity should be towards all, towards all, towards each one. And it should be abounding, increasing. It should be multiplying. I should have more charity today than I had yesterday. But is that true of me? I should have more charity this year than I had 10 years ago. I should think, is that true of me? In my marital life, my wife should be happier today that I'm more considerate, more merciful, more kind, more understanding, more charitable than I was eight, ten years ago. Is that true of me? Put it to yourself. Do you have more charity today than you had ten years ago? Than you had when you first became a Christian? Do you have more charity today than you had when you first got married? You think about Think about the love you had towards your wife, towards your husband during the courtship. And uh, on, in the first week of the wedding, think of the charity, think of the love, think of the kindness, think of the mercies, think of the relationship. Is it better today than 10 years ago? Let it increase. Let it abound. Let it become more edifying. Let's look at First Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Here, the apostle begins to tell us what charity actually does. You know, sometimes we forget ourselves. We forget ourselves. And uh, we quickly and easily repeat the failings of other people. I don't know why we do this, but you know, uh, by and large, everyone will have his mistakes to make. That may surprise you. I'm not supporting sin. I'm not saying that everybody will be committing sin. No, the Bible says, if anyone is born of God, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. The seed of God remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of 
God. But the point I'm making is this, my brothers and sisters. Our heart may be perfect, but our head may not be perfect. A brother comes late to the church. Well, I don't like him to be late, but maybe he doesn't want to be late also. Maybe he has a sick child at home. Maybe she has um, a problem that she had to look into at home. Maybe it was because there was a heavy load that, you know, weighed her down. And uh, if I say, I don't know why she came late, I'm right. But then I might say, it's not good to be late. And you people that are coming late, you know, those comments may just cut down people without knowing why they came late. Let there be fervent charity. Let there be charity that is evident that we can see in the midst of the children of God. And then it says, there is one thing charity will do. Charity will cover up a lot of sins, a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors. That's why I said on Saturday to the workers that it is wrong. It is wrong for us to be going about and spreading the mistakes of our coordinators, the mistakes of our zonal leaders, the mistakes of our women representatives. You know, sometimes uh, something happens. And the people have been talking bad about uh, maybe a particular zonal leader. And they spread all that about. And what they are talking about is just that they are magnifying it. It's, it's nothing. It has no root. It, uh, it has no weight. It's something that a loving church, a loving community, a loving congregation should have overlooked. And eventually we choose that zonal leader as a coordinator. But before he's chosen as a coordinator, they have spoiled his name. They have spoiled his character. They have spoiled everything that it is difficult to even trust him in that community. I think we have to stop all this spreading of things that are not true, things that are not essential, things that are cutting down other people. Let there be fervent charity among us, and let that charity cover the multitude of sins. We're not talking about compromise. We're talking about love. We're talking about being considerate. We're talking about being real children of God. Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and see the characteristics of this charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from verse 4. Charity suffers long and it's kind. Charity envies not. What makes us sometimes to put down other people? When somebody has taught us the scripture, what makes us to say, I can do better? That's envy. But charity envies not. Charity wanteth not itself. What makes us to belittle other people, put down other people? Well, because we're trying to put up ourselves. Because we're trying to say, I can do better. Well, if you can do better, wait for your own chance. Charity wanteth not itself. It's not put up. Charity does not behave itself unseemly. Charity seeketh not her own interest. Charity is not easily provoked, doesn't get angry. And it will not get angry and bitter outside or inside. And um, it thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. When somebody is disciplined, you don't rejoice. And you don't begin to publicize it. A brass and so is, uh, is disciplined. But why? In a one uh, district, somebody is just rebuked. Uh, you know, for a few days, as brother, please pray on this point. A minor thing that you don't know anything about. And then we're here in other districts. How did we hear in other districts? It is people who are rejoicing in iniquity who are publicizing such a thing about, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That is the way it should be. Now let's quickly go to the next point, our calling. Our calling, the Christian calling. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. Sorry, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Here we are told of our calling. That is, we are called to live a life glorifying unto God in the kingdom of God. And on the one hand, as I said before, there will be peace. On the other hand, there will be thankfulness. Our calling demands that there will be peace and there will be thankfulness in Ephesians chapter 4. 
Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Here is our calling. What does that calling entail? Verses 2 and 3. With all lowliness and meekness, and with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is, we keep the unity of the Spirit. Let there be unity in the church, harmony in the church, and the peace of God. That is the way we fulfill our Christian calling. That is, we remain in the bond of peace. Now, to explain that and analyze that, let us look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, from verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Here is our calling. What is our calling? Our calling is to follow the footsteps of the Prince of Peace. And how did Jesus Christ manifest that he was the Prince of Peace? He was not the author of confusion, the author of trouble, or the author of, um, of, of the storm in the midst of the people of God, or the way he manifested it. This, look at verse 22. Who did no sin? Neither was God found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. That's somebody seeking peace. Somebody you revile, and he will not reply in a bad word. Somebody that you mistakenly you treat, or maybe deliberately injure, but he will not reply. He will not fight back. He will not retaliate. That's our calling. That's how to maintain the peace of God in our, in our midst. When he suffered, he threatened not. Oh, that would be a peaceful family. That a wife is suffering, but he will not, she will not threaten. She will not say, I'm fed up with the marriage. I'm going to pack out a woman that never threatens her husband, that never says, go and find somebody to cook for you. Go and tell your junior sister to be coming and living here since, uh, you know, you put all the emphasis on your junior sister and I will have to pack out, I will have to go and live alone. A woman that will never threaten, that's the woman that is seeking for peace. A person in the church that will say, that will never say, I'll never be a worker again. Well, I've been hurt, I've been injured. Oh, we're sorry we injured you. I, as a pastor, I say openly, we're sorry we injured you. And uh, we didn't want to injure you. And it's the devil that made us to injure you. We don't want to injure you. Oh, pastor said something I don't like. He has injured me. I'm never going to work in the church. Take my apology. We're sorry that we injured you. Oh, coordinator said something and he injured us. Oh, on, on his behalf, let me apologize. We're sorry we injured you. And, uh, you know, some members of the church, they've done something. We're sorry. But don't threaten. Don't say, I will never be in that church. I will never walk in that church. I will never cooperate in that church. What do you want us to do? We've injured you. We have injured you. And uh, the egg that we have dropped on the ground is broken already. We cannot gather it up anymore. All we can do is say, oh, brother, we're sorry we injured you. Don't threaten us that you will not be with us again. We love you. We don't want you to go. We want you to remain with us here. We really appreciate you. It's unfortunate in the past we offended you. But don't threaten. Don't say, I will go. Don't say, I will not walk in that place again. Don't say, they don't appreciate me. Maybe we didn't appreciate you in the past, but we appreciate you now. We love you now. We are sorry for our mistake in the past. But you see, when you are seeking peace, you will not threaten. You will not say, I'm going to another church. Don't go to another church. Forgive us and stay with us here. When he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. That's the Prince of Peace. That's the Prince of Peace. And that is how he kept the peace in the midst of the people of God. Let's follow after that way of peace. That is our calling. My brother, that is your calling. My sister, that is your calling. Let there be peace and let there be thankfulness. In all things, let us always be grateful to the Lord that every time that whatever has happened, we're grateful to the Lord. Let that thankfulness be there. That gratitude be there. 
and always look up to the Lord that it will help us to manifest Christian character, to put on Christian charity, and to walk in the path that reveals your Christian calling. Let us rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that God will help us, that we will have this Christian character. We will have the Christian charity. We will have the Christian calling and walk in the path that reveals our Christian calling. My brother, rise up and pray. My sister, rise up and pray. You heard yesterday of the evidence of the grace of God in our lives. Let us have more of that evidence. More of that evidence. And let us talk to the Lord today. If you have not been saved, my friend, here tonight, call upon the Lord and be born again. And if you have been born again, tell the Lord you want to manifest all this Christian character, the Christian charity, and manifest the Christian calling. The Lord will help you. The Lord will help you. He has made all these things available to us. Put it on. Put it on. You will see that Christian character fits you. Put it on. You will see Christian charity fits you. Put it on. And this is your Christian calling. Walk in the way of peace.